Hello and welcome to this week's Collective Worship with Mr. Buckridge and with Abigail. Now Abigail, I understand you've got uh, an exciting day coming up at school soon? Well, so I've been told by my teacher we've hopefully got a sports day coming up. Good. Um, and do you think it would be a good idea to do sports day without having had any breakfast or any food before you go and try and do your races? That would be a terrible idea. Why do you think that would be? Um, because you need food you to need... eat, to run. And to give you the energy to go. Yeah. Absolutely. Now there's something coming up that's a bit bigger, not, not too much bigger than your sports day, but coming up in the summer where the people involved would probably be very careful about their diet. Do you know what that is? I believe that that would be the Olympics. Okay, so only a little bit bigger. Just, just a little. Just a little bit bigger. You know, when you've done some exercise, there's nothing better than coming into your home and smelling the aroma of someone who's perhaps cooking dinner uh, ready uh, for you. Because when you've done some exercise, you're ready for some food. Now, some of you may know that Mrs. Buckridge likes to bake cakes. And it's lovely to smell those cakes, isn't it, when you come into the house. But there's another smell that we really, really like when we come into the house sometimes as well. Do you know, what, what is that, Abigail? That is a smell of bread. Freshly baked bread. What a lovely smell that is. You know, bread is one of the most basic and essential foods that is used all around the world. One of the members of the church that Abigail and I belong to is the chief process engineer for a company called Baker Perkins. Now part of what Baker Perkins do is provide equipment for factories to make bread. Andrew knows just a little bit about bread because he's been working on these factory lines, these equipment for about 40 years. He's visited around 20 countries multiple times to install and to repair these types of machines. He very kindly agreed to talk us around the process of what happens in a bread making factory so that you know and I know where we get our bread. Hello and welcome to the wonderful world of bread making. The equipment you'll see here is what most manufacturers in the UK use to make sliced white bread or other varieties. It starts at the mixer where some small hand ingredients are added, then flour, water and yeast are added automatically. This mixer makes about 380 kilograms of dough, enough for about 420 loaves every three minutes. We use about 4.5 million tonnes of wheat a year to make bread in the UK. The lid is locked on the mixer and three minutes later the dough is tipped into a tub and hoisted in the air. It is dropped into a divider. The divider accurately scales each dough piece by volume at 920 grams. Each loaf must weigh an average of 800 grams when it is sliced, packed and finished. And we have laws to make sure it's correct. These plants produce about 10,000 an hour or 166 pieces a minute. This next machine you'll see takes the square dough piece and makes it round. All that pipework transfers air to stop it sticking to the surface of the machine. On the left of the picture a machine that checks the weight can be seen. The dough is transferred to a large box called an intermediate prover where it gets a rest after all the work it has just been through. Once it has been relaxed, it is transferred to the moulder. It takes about four minutes to transfer in these cradles and a bit like a hammock for dough. The dough is then dropped onto a conveyor and starts its final transfer to the moulder. The moulder converts the round dough ball into a long thin sheet at the front. You can see in the slow motion video what was a round dough ball is now a coiled sheet. The more coils that can be made without damage to the dough the better the bread texture will be. In the second phase you can see the dough being squeezed out 
from the top to help the shape. That gives the required length to the dough piece. Too much pressure, it damages the loaf. Too little, and the shape is poor. The dough can be cut like this into four pieces and turned. This gives better texture and colour to, to the final product. We produce most of this type of bread for sandwiches. And we'll produce something like 12 billion sandwiches a year, or 230 sandwiches each person in the country. The other option is to do what we call straight single piece bread. In this we just mould the dough into an oblong, again using the pressure board to get the right length, and then we run it round the, the conveyors and put it in the tins. If we don't cut it and we make it straight like this, it will change the texture and the internal characteristics of the bread. It's also a different shape because most of these are made without a lid, so they have a domed top instead of a flat top. It's proved for about an hour and baked for 24 minutes before it goes into the cooler for two hours and is sliced. That's the story of bread so far. I hope you enjoy eating it. Well, hi, Andrew. Thanks for joining us and for uh, sharing your expertise uh, and showing us how bread is made in the UK. And also, I guess you've gone around the world with this kind of equipment that you've shown us as well. Is that right? Yes, we've travelled uh, pretty extensively around the, any country that makes sliced white bread. So there's not as many as we would think. But they, it is spread right around the world, from here through Africa to Australia through America. Why do you think bread is so widely used? A lot of it depends on the crop variety that they grow in the country. So if you go to eastern uh, countries where you're talking about Japan, China, the Middle East, those sort of areas where you have uh, high rice crops, then they tend not to eat quite so much bread. There still is a lot of uh, wheat grown but you have to have a particular variety for bread. And so you need to have uh, a climate that grows bread that's suitable, a uh, wheat that's suitable for bread making. Okay, so you, you've, you've mentioned you've been to many countries and those countries, uh, many of those countries use bread as a basic food. Have you noticed any interesting differences between different countries in the type of bread or the processes that they use to make bread? Uh, basically, it boils down to speed uh, and cost. So, in a lot of the the, the quiet, the smaller countries or countries where they don't have as much mechanisation, where your electricity supply isn't as reliable, you tend to have smaller bakeries, and and therefore people like small uh, one-man bands where there's just one man making bread, uh, and that's where you see that in a lot of the Middle East countries. Uh, so, you'll have a small baker just making loaves one at a time. You tend to find in uh, those countries where it's slightly like Middle East countries, they have that very flat bread. So something like pita breads um, or very long, thin breads with very little yeast and very little volume. And they're certainly not sliced. And you it's, it's more like a tear and share type product. So you buy it home, take it home as a big loaf and you just tear a piece off, but it's, it's fairly thin. Whereas once you come to Europe, we tend to use a lot more yeast and we look for a lot more volume and we use tins where they don't use any tins to keep the loaf shape. Since you've been to many different countries, you've probably um, had a lot of bread. Have you got any favorite breads or would there be any that you would recommend specifically? Uh, I really like brown breads and wholemeals, malted grains. So anything with grain in is my favorite, I have to say. Uh, for white breads, anything that's a, a really nice sourdough that's had plenty of time to ferment to give it good flavour and good crust. Uh, that would be, those would be my two favourites, would anything with seed and a good sourdough. Fantastic. Starting to make us feel hungry. Um, as someone who's been involved in the bread industry for so many years, do you have any thoughts on why Jesus might have described himself as the bread of the bread of life it seems a bit strange to us that a person would say i am the bread uh, of life have you got any thoughts on that 
Well, a couple of things from a scientific point of view, bread provides protein, it provides starch, so you can survive off bread quite easily and it has a lot of nutrients that keep you and allow you to grow. So you can eat as much or as little as you like. So if you're older, you might need, you might need more. If you're very young, you might not need so much, but there's always enough. Uh, it's an easy product to get hold of. It's, it's, it's simple. It, it's a simple product to eat. There's no complexity to it. Once it's baked, you don't have any more work to do. You just have to put butter on and enjoy it. And the Lord Jesus Christ is a little bit like that. He's very simple to get hold of. You can have as much or as little as you like in terms of how much time you spend with him. But he will always feed you and you will always grow spiritually. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's the most important thing is not the, um, the, the quantity, but the quality of what you eat. Um, and feeding on the bread of life means that you will spiritually stay alive. Um, and if you don't eat bread or you don't eat any food, but bread uh, in countries where there's a lot of uh, poverty, bread is a staple diet. And you, you, that might be the only food you have. Uh, we're very fortunate in this country that we're not in that scenario. But for a lot of people, that is their source of food supply and it will keep you alive. And the Lord Jesus Christ can claim to be the bread of life because he will give you eternal life not just life here. That's fantastic. Really appreciate your thoughts and your help this week for uh, our collective worship. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. Thank you very much. Jesus talked about being the bread of life right after a really famous incident in his life. It was so famous that all four of his biographers recorded this story. Andrew, one of the disciples was getting worried on this particular day. There was a huge number of people that had been listening to Jesus teach right throughout the day. And they had been so gripped by the teaching that they hadn't bothered to eat. In fact, some of them probably hadn't even brought any food thinking that they weren't going to be there for the whole day. Now I wonder, have you been so enthralled by your teachers and your lessons at school that you forget about lunchtime? Abigail's shaking her head and I expect you are as well. Well, Andrew was concerned that these people would be getting hungry and that some of them would have a distance to travel and that might cause some of them uh, to grow faint as they're walking home. At a suitable point, he mentioned his concern to Jesus. And he was shocked at the response Jesus gave. Jesus said, you give them food to eat. How was Andrew going to feed 5,000 men plus the woman and the children as well? Even if he had had a year's worth of wages, he would have been struggling to buy enough bread to feed all of these people. Jesus then asked Andrew, have you got any food? Well, Andrew didn't, but him and some of the other disciples searched around and eventually they found a boy who had a packed lunch. Just enough for a healthy young lad. Five loaves of bread and two small fish. Well, Andrew brought the boy to the Lord Jesus, but he said, what is this small packed lunch among so many people? Andrew knew that he nor anyone else would be able to provide sufficient food for all of these people. Jesus seemed confident, however. He told the disciples to sit the people down in various groups. And then he took the five loaves and two fish and he gave thanks for it. Then he started to break the bread and to break the fish. And he gave them to the disciples to give out. And why right from the beginning, the disciples were amazed that as Jesus broke the bread and the fish, there already seemed to be more than when they had begun. And as Andrew kept coming back to the Lord Jesus, as he kept breaking the bread, he was amazed as he saw the food keep on multiplying. It was as though every time Jesus was breaking the bread, he was creating more food. Eventually, everyone there had had enough. But then Jesus said another surprising thing to Philip. Philip and the rest of you disciples, 
collect up everything that is left over. The rest, Andrew thought. Surely there couldn't be anything left. We only started with five loaves and two fish and we fed all these people. But away he and the other disciples went and they ended up collecting 12 baskets full of leftover. Andrew was amazed. Jesus had done what no one else could do on that day. After that, Jesus travelled across the Lake of Galilee, but many of the people followed him, wanting to make him king. But Jesus knew that they were only excited because of the food that he had given them, rather than the fact that he had just done a great miracle. They were more enthusiastic about the gift than they were about the giver. And Jesus wanted them to understand a more important lesson than the fact that he was just able to provide enough food for them. You see, just like we all need food, like bread, to grow, get energy, to live, so Jesus taught the people that he is the bread of life. If we want eternal life, a relationship with God, and fullness of life, then we need what only Jesus can give. You might not understand what I'm going to say next, but some of you might. You see, as we grow, we often experience inner hungers, longings or desires that the material things that we use and we enjoy, and even other people, can't always meet. Just like Andrew couldn't meet the needs of the other people, so there's some things and some feelings in life that we will find that others and other things just can't meet. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, he was saying this, that those deepest inner hungers can only be met by him. He is the only one, just like on that day he fed the 5,000 men plus women and children, he is the only one who can meet those deepest needs that we have and satisfy us completely. Because he is God. That's what the miracle showed. He is God. And he is the God who made us and therefore knows just what we need and is able to provide it. Let's listen or join in with a song that reminds us to be thankful for the food that we eat and all of the other good blessings that we have.
Now it's time to reflect on some of those things that uh, we've thought about today. Let's pray. Dear God, we give thanks for the good things that we have. We give thanks for the food that we are able to eat. And we'd remember those who are not so blessed as we are in all of the abundance of food uh, that we often can enjoy. We think of those who are helping uh, to provide that need. And we pray that you would bless them as they would do that. We give thanks too for the Lord Jesus, the bread of life, who came that he might satisfy and meet the very deepest needs that every single one of us had. We pray now that you bless us in all that we would do throughout this week. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, once again, it's been good to see you. We hope you have a really, really great week in all that you do. And until next week's collective worship from Abigail and from me, Mr. Buckridge. Goodbye.